ATA. Uh, we're an organisation that's been going for 30 years and we publish this magazine in every quarter. We publish another one every alternate quarter called Renew, so you find those in the news agents. Um, this evening it's not the 18th of July, it's the 18th of August, <laughs> for those who have had noticed. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Stuart Martin, who's from the Australian Solar Energy Council. Yep. 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 Um, and he's just going to talk about Sustainable House Day. Just, just a brief mention about Sustainable House Day, which is on this year on the 7th and 14th of September over two weekends. So there'll be some houses open on the first Sunday and others on the second Sunday. So Alan has already put a note in the newsletter, the ATA newsletter, but there are um, some houses looking for volunteers. So if you're interested in helping out, just go to the website, the solarhouseday.com. Uh, if you're available for a couple of two or three hours and you've got the rest of the weekend to look around the other houses or other weekends. Um, well that's about it I think and Alan will put a, a note in the next newsletter uh, for everybody to have a look at. And the houses are on the website. It's so about five or six houses are open in Adelaide at least. I think in Hawthorne, Aldinga, South Brighton, Albert Park and Semaphore Park are the ones I know about at the moment. So uh, anybody that's available for those houses would be great. Okay, thanks Luke. Okay. Good, thanks. Okay, so Sustainable House Day, great day if you've never been to it. It's a good way to see houses in action. Um, Mustafa, I'd like to thank Mustafa for coming along. And he's going to tell us all about green walls and green roofs. And he's just finished his submission for his thesis two weeks ago, so he's, he's all relaxed. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mustafa, uh, I did my PhD during the last three to four years at UniSA under supervision of Professor Simon Beecham. Uh, in this presentation, I will talk about firstly about the result of my green roof project, and later uh, I will talk about. So I'll just give you that. So you can go here. Yeah, yeah that's probably better. Uh, I will talk about the green wall project. What we uh, we are going to do regarding green roof. Just hold it hold it close. Okay. Yeah, it's good. It's all. It's all right. Okay, uh, as a background, uh, as you know, uh, the, because of urbanization growth, uh, increasing in population, uh, the natural uh, urban catchment has been changed. Uh, we can see more uh, impermeable area as uh, roads or highways in the cities, uh, which the native vegetation has been removed from the cities. Uh, you can see from those uh, graphs. Uh, also, Australia is uh, one of the most urbanized countries in the world, which 85% of in, its inhabitants are living in the town and cities. Uh, in the urban uh, area, 20 to 40% of impervious area uh, are uh, generally occupied by the roofs, and also, uh, I mean, the roofs and uh, both. Uh, are the places that we can return the vegetation to the urban environment. Uh, the another problem is uh, increasing in urban temperature. Uh, during last 10 years, especially during 2003-2012, uh, was one of, the, one of the warmest decade in Australia. Also, as you remember, the last summer in Adelaide was uh, one of the hottest uh, summer with three consecutive, consecutive days uh, that the temperature was about 43 degrees. A researcher from Flinders University did uh, some monitoring and they used uh, uh, sensors and they, on their car and drove across the Adelaide CBD and uh, they showed there is an urban heat island effects in Adelaide city, which urban heat island means that temperature of a city is uh, ha more uh, higher than surrounding urban area. And they, they concluded that western part of the city, which is the place of the new Royal Adelaide Hospital, is the hottest uh, place in the city. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so uh, returning the vegetation to the urban, uh, it's going to be one of the climate change adaptation techniques that can reduce the urban temperature as well. So, water sensitive urban design is one of the solutions uh, that through these uh, techniques we can return the vegetation to the urban area. Uh, from another point of view, Adelaide has got a 30 years plan. 
uh, in this plant, uh, most of the WSUD technologies has been recommended, uh, like swells, bioretention, pavements, and for a specific green, bro green roof and green wall are the recommended uh, technology for the future of Adelaide. So, in the first part of my research, I focus on the green wall. Uh, the benefits of green bar are in the three categories of environmental, social, uh, and economic. For instance, in the air environmental area, they can increase carbon sequestration, they can improve the air quality, or urban heat, urban heat island mitigation. Uh, in the economic area, it can increase the land values, it could uh, help to reduce the energy consumption of building. And in the social section, it can establish an urban green bay for the residents. So, Green Bowl is, a, in, is an engineered uh, multi layer structure. The outer layer is vegetation layer. Uh, the next layer, vegetation planted on the growing media. That's the next layer. It could have the green roofs can have filter layer, drainage layer, <coughs> protection mat, waterproof membrane, and insulation layer. Also, green roofs are called as a living roof, or vegetated roof, or an eco roof. <coughs> the most uh, research question and uh, the most uh, important design criteria is how to design uh, this combination of green roof or layer together. So we were looking in a specific which, which of these layers are suitable for Adelaide weather condition in our research. Uh, there are three different categories of green roof, uh, extensive, semi-intensive, and intensive. The extensive green roof is uh, the main driver of this category or classification is the depth of growing media. So for extensive, the depth is less than 100 millimeter. Uh, between 80 to 200 millimeter is uh, categorized as semi-intensive, and uh, intensive green roofs are more, uh, has a depth of growing media more than uh, 200 millimeters. So, if we want to compare the difference between the intensive and extensive and semi-intensive, uh, the diversity of plants that we can use in the intensive green roofs are uh, greater. Uh, we can achieve more insulation from the intensive green roof. Uh, they have the the intensive system has more uh, energy efficiency. They are they have more weight. They are heavier. This uh, we can uh, implement the intensive green roofs on the flat roof, but it's possible to uh, implement the extensive and semi-intensive on the pitch roof. Uh, intensive roof needs more maintenance, uh, they need irrigation and uh, more technical advice. Uh, they can mitigate, for instance, uh, stormwater, they can uh, retain more stormwater. Uh, they are, the intensive system is simple to access, but uh, the extensive is hard. Uh, the capital cost of the intensive system is higher than in, uh, extensive. and. Uh, the drainage system is larger in intensive than extensive and semi-intensive. So we can use the more species of plants like shrubs and trees in the intensive system, but on the extensive and semi-intensive we have limitation of selecting what sort of plant we can use. Uh, before we start, we did a literature review across the available uh, publication, especially we look at the high rainfall area of uh, Asia like Singapore and Japan. And Europe, like uh, countries like Germany, Sweden, Belgium, Italy, and look at the United States and Canada. Uh, especially, we will look at the area of the project that they work, what sort of a slope they use, uh, substrate or growing mat material they use, uh, the rainfall events that they monitor, uh, period of monitoring of their project, and about the also water quality and retention coefficient that they work. Uh, also, uh, there were some study before we started at Melbourne and Auckland, but we were looking what is uh, what sort of research questions need to be answered in Adelaide weather condition. So, in conclusion, uh, Williams uh, et al. 
they describe the opportunities and barrier for rooftop greening in Australia and they concluded that there is a lack of a standard at the moment in Australia that there is high cost of installation uh, there, there are few demonstration examples lack of relevant and reliable research in Australia with that condition uh, there is difference between the climate of Australia and Northern Hemisphere countries we have here different rainfall pattern and subset on top of vegetation and the available standards, especially from Northern Hemisphere country, are less applicable in Australia and in South Australia. Uh, for some example of green proof in Australia, the first one is federal government in Canberra. The other one is the most iconic, uh, is the Melbourne desalinization plant, which is open in 2012. Uh, there are some DIY green roofs, uh, which I found this from this website. People grow pumpkin on the rooftop. Also, they put the green roof on the storage area or the other one in the moss plant. Uh, if we come back to Adelaide, uh, the moss uh, uh, green roofs that we, uh, there is available in Adelaide, uh, it's related to the Adelaide Zoo. Uh, the, the first one is the, and the entrance of the Adelaide Zoo on the top left. Uh, the indoor dome building, the camping area, and also the, visiting se the visitor center in, inside the zoo. So, uh, in a specific, my research was comprised of three experiments. Uh, the first experiment was located on top of ANZ House on the Weymouth Street. We were looking at the uh, stone water quality and quantity, thermal performance and plant performance. Uh, the item three and four, uh, another researcher was looking at those uh, objectives. Uh, because the design of the ANZ house was based on the base of the free drainage and we were looking at the water quality and quantity, the problem was we couldn't get the outflow from the one unique system and the system was uh, on the unsealed system. So we exactly replicated and built the uh, ANZ house green, uh, green roofs on the uh, medium scale. At Wonson Lake Campus, we looked at stone water again, quality, quantity, thermal performance, and plant performance. Plant performance, uh, because the basically the design of uh, those uh, parts was uh, from the landscape architect. So, because I needed more details for uh, in terms of academic course and doing enough course for PhD, so we designed the third part of my studies. Uh, which happen on the randomized the small scale green roofs in the 16 beds. I will gonna uh, talk in detail further. And we will look at the stone water quality again, quantity, plant performance, uh, thermal benefits, and water balance model. So we did our monitoring nearly th through the three years, and. The topic of my thesis was developing resilient green roofs for Adelaide, which is different from the topic of this presentation. So the first uh, location of my study was on top of ANZ House, Ramos Street. This part of the study was founded jointly by the government, uh, South Australian Government Building Innovation and Aspen Development. Uh, the duration of the study was for a year, 12 months, and uh, in a universe, we were involved or in charge of a water quality and usage study, monitoring of thermal, perm thermal performance used by uh, Adelaide Uni, Roger Clay, Professor Roger Clay, and the architectural uh, aspect and plant performance done by Graham Hopkins or Fifth Creek Studio. So, uh, four green roof beds was installed on top of the uh, ANZ house. At it was comprised of two intensive. Uh, the depth of the intensive was 300 millimeter. The dimension was 4.5 meter by 3 meter. And two extensive, the depth was 100 millimeter. Uh, again, the, in the same dimension. And it had a control limit area of 54 square meter. Uh, this uh, slide shows the how we 
built that green roofs on the ANZ house rooftop. Uh, the top left shows the uh, existing asphalt roof. Uh, the first layer was the waterproofing, then drainage layer comes up the waterproofing, then geofabric layer or root barrier, then the substrate and growing material moved into the systems. Uh, <coughs> these systems got the irrigation systems which were in the middle of the uh, each four systems and the uh, last layer, the final layer was planting and this is the uh, final look of the uh, ANZ grid roofs. Uh, we used four native Australian plants which were the Carpovorotus rossi, Lomandra, Dinella and Myrporum. ANZ house is the fourth uh, tallest uh, building in the CBD. Also the growing media that we used was uh, combination of, the media one was combination of crushed red brick, scoria, core fiber, and composted organics. The second media was a uh, combination of scoria, composted pine bark, and hydrocell flakes. So the first research question on the first part of the study was uh, to look at what are the effects of intensive and extensive green roofs on the stone water quality, and what are the possible reuse of uh, or option for the outflow of water from green roofs? So the sort of maintenance that uh, applied on this bed, uh, Graham apl uh, applied one kilogram of osmocote fertilizer during uh, 15 weeks, and uh, the irrigation that applied in this system was for just five months of the year from the 6th of December until 6th of May and the system was uh, without irrigating during seven months of the year. And the system were irrigated three times a week uh, with the volume of two point liter per square meter per day. So uh, the main challenge that we had how we can uh, was how to collect the outflow water from the system, why the design is uh, based on the free drainage system. So uh, we tried different uh, solutions to collect how to collect the uh, stormwater runoff from the system. So the problem was we weren't allowed to add any further I mean, uh, uh, devices on the roof because of the uh, type of the building, this building. Uh, so we concluded and we came up to put the half round pipe under the soil. Uh, these pipes were uh, connected to the house from the, uh, the hole that drilled on both sides. Uh, and the pipes were buried under the soil. Uh, then uh, we, tried, uh, some, we tried to how to collect the water. We initially started to collect the water samples by syringe. But it was very hard and we weren't able to collect the enough water for water quality sample. So we used the uh, vacuum pump for uh, sucking up the water from the systems. Uh, so the plan of uh, this uh, diagram shows uh, how we collect the samples. We put those uh, two of those uh, round half part in each of the green roof system. Uh, overall, we had 10 points for measuring water samples. We also collected water samples from the aluminium, existing aluminium roof, and also from the asphalt roof. Each time we collected 12 samples. Uh, and overall, we were uh, able to collect uh, our samples in five, uh, five months, which uh, we collected totally 60 samples. All of the samples were straight away moved uh, to University of South Australia and we did our tests uh, for measuring parameters like pH, turbidity, EC, nitrate, orthophosphate, uh, TDS, potassium, chlorine and metals and heavy metals. And we sent some of the samples to the SA Water Labs uh, for checking our uh, tests. Uh, we use uh, a statistical techniques for comparing our uh, results. 
But most of the results shows that the most question is about is uh, whether the green roofs act as a source of pollutant or sinks of the pollutant. In this project, because we started collecting water samples, was soon after establishing the system, uh, most of the green roof acted as a source of pollutant. You can see from these graphs that uh, the quality from the aluminum roof and ashwat is uh, better, quite better from the green roofs. Then we compare our result with the available uh, state, national, and international uh, standards. Uh, as you can see, except for the, some uh, cases of the turbidity, uh, nitrate, phosphorus, and potassium, in most of the cases, it's possible to use uh, the water for mostly non-potable and urban irrigation. So at the end, uh, Generally, the performance of extensive green roofs was better than the intensive systems. Uh, many of the pollutants that were detected from the outflow of the system, they were largely sourced from the applied fertilizer, leaching of the substrate, the constituent, and also the complementary irrigation that we use during the summertime with the municipal water. In terms of uh, potential of recycling outflow water from the green roofs. Uh, after looking at the available standards, uh, we recommended to use the such water for urban landscape irrigation and non, not using that water for the uh, potable use. And it's possible to use it as the toilet flushing as well. So. Uh, in terms of thermal performance, uh, the result of uh, research by Hopkins shows that the green roof, sur the asphalt surface could be increased up to 51 degrees, while uh, the temperature on the drainage layer of the green roofs uh, under, in under the intensive system, it's around 30 to 20, uh, 28 to 30, and under the extensive system is between 26 to, uh, to 31 degrees. So they concluded that from the intensive system, we can have 40% reduction in surface temperature, and also from the extensive system, we can achieve 8 to 20% reduction in surface temperature. And also, if you look at the temperature above a meter above the those green roof system is less than the temperature above the uh, existing asphalt roof. So as I said, uh, we collected our water quality samples, but for continuing our uh, water quantity study, uh, we uh, built the same replica of ANZ green roofs at the Mawson Lakes campus. Uh, we were looking at three research questions at this part of the study. Uh, the first one was how the plant grows and survive, survive a red would be in green roof, uh, considering the media depth and growing media type and irrigation scenarios. Uh, the next question was to what extent can intensive and extensive green roofs uh, potentially mitigate urban heat island? effects and how can different scenario of adding green roofs to a typical Adelaide urban environment reduce urban temperature. And uh, the next, uh, the last part on this bit was uh, what is the hydrological behavior of extensive and intensive green roofs in a dry climate. So as I said, uh, we built, we started with the timber and aluminum sheets and built the same system. We built four uh, green roof beds. As you can see from here, uh, we sealed this system and we were able to get the outflow from just uh, from a one uh, with from a drainage point. Uh, so we also uh, consider a rain gauge adjacent to the bed. Also, we connected each of the drainage point to the. Uh, runoff tipping bucket for measuring the outflow. Uh, 16 plants were, random, were randomized on each green roof bed. Uh, we 
consider two uh, scenario of watering. One of them was just uh, watering with stone water. The other one was watering with stone water and uh, irrigation. Uh, both rain gauge and rainfall and runoff tipping butter, uh, they were connected to the data logger. You can see from here. And through the mobile connection, I was able to retrieve the data on my PC. So, uh, we monitored this system, the plant performance, for uh, one year. We looked at the plant heights as a horizont horizontal growth. We looked at the root and shoot biomass, number of leaves, flowers, plant growth reduced as a horizontal growth. We looked at the survival rate, leaf succulent, and root growth during this one year of study. Again, we use the statistical techniques to weigh ANOVA to compare the results. Uh, you can see uh, this graph shows the, the scenario of irrigation, stone water and irrigation, and stone water with no irrigation. In most of the cases and all of the corresponding uh, factors, in the irrigation side and stone water, we, have, we get higher values. Uh, for a specific, if you look at the uh, survival rate, uh, we can see we have more survival on the irrigation side than the non-irrigation side. Uh, we get more survival uh, rate on the intensive system than the extensive system. In a specific, uh, and with regard to the plant type, uh, we had 75% survived uh, in in Dynella plants, 56% in Lomandra, 87% of Myoporum, and 100% of uh, Carpobrotus, they were all survived, or big face. Normally, plants are belonging to three categories, C3 plants, C4, or camp plants. Uh, this uh, Carbobrotus or pig face is uh, belonging to the camp plant or Crassulian acid metabolism. This sort of plant can, uh, can close the stomata in the day and open it in the night. I mean, they are very tolerant to the uh, heat and uh, salinity stresses. Uh, and also, this plant shows a very high water use efficiency. Uh, so this is the picture of our front yard. So we were stuck. We had problem with weeds all the time, up to two years ago. Uh, we planted the carpobrotus since uh, last year, and this photo is today, and they work very well at the moment. So in the next part of the study, we were uh, looking at uh, urban heat island mitigation in two scale of micro and micro scale of Adelaide. Uh, in one typical uh, day, we collected the temperature data of uh, six weather stations inside the city, uh, around the city, and far from the city in Adelaide, uh, Adelaide Airport, Mount Lofty, Parfield, Norlanga, Mount Crawford. And uh, the result shows that temperature as far as we get very close to the city, the temperature is higher than surrounding, which means that uh, losing or reduction in vegetation, it's, it's one of the reasons for uh, increasing temperature in the urban area. Also, we look at the uh, different uh, used material in the urban environment, like corrugated metal, pavement, asphalt, and you can see in a typical day when the weather temperature is around 37, they could be 54 degrees centigrade, or the pavement could be 41, and as well could be uh, 48 degrees, while the plants are around 28 degrees. So it means these materials uh, have the heat island potential, which we calculated in the, here. So also, there is another thing uh, that each material have got the albedo coefficient or reflection. Uh, the more albedo, albedo coefficient, uh, uh, the less temperature that can have that material. Uh, also, 
we look at the thermal variation in the green roof beds in the depth, uh, so the result showed uh, that uh, the intensive system, the variation of temperature in the intensive system is less than extensive system. Uh, and most of the times, uh, the temperature was between 2 to 5 degree in green roof system, cooler than uh, surrounding area. Uh, we used this result uh, for scenario modeling. Uh, we used the NVMet model. Uh, we look at the five scenario. We selected the patch of the CBD. Uh, that's the north part of the Victoria Square. Uh, we, uh, we try to add the green roofs on the impermeable and possible area of the roof. Uh, look at the different scenario of adding 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, and 50% of uh, the possible roofs with green roofs. And the results show that, uh, that they, they, the adding more green roofs, it's reduced the temperature, but it's not that much. It's uh, around 0.1 reduction on the a surface area and it's around 0.25 between the height of 100 meter and on the uh, on the on the street. So uh, the result show it means that just adding the green roof is not the solution. Sometimes the uh, design of the urban area and also it needs another sort of management like adding green boards and another green area. Uh, they should integrate together for getting more reduction in the temperature. The next part is uh, about uh, hydrology of green roof. Um, uh, this equation is about the mass balance equation. So uh, for a study of hydrology of green roofs, uh, we need to study about the, the, what comes to the, to the green roof system. Uh, the precipitation and irrigation are the inflow to the green roof system if we want to study about the hydrology. And the outflow or runoff are the, uh, what comes off the system. Uh, in most of the cities that they have drainage problem, uh, green roofs is account for the source control uh, strategy. I mean, in, for instance, in the high rainfall cities, they try to implement and add the green roof systems uh, to reduce the uh, urban, urban runoff. Uh, so if you look at uh, this picture, uh, this graph shows the uh, a storm water, a storm water runoff from the conventional roof and the green roof system. The green, a green roof system can mitigate the runoff. Uh, it can uh, make the lag time and also mitigate the pickup runoff. So that's one of the important uh, study also about the green roof is to know how about how they work from hydrological point of view. So for this reason, we monitor each green roof uh, bed for nearly two years. Uh, during this period of times, we uh, we recorded 226 rainfalls. Uh, among those rainfalls, uh, we. Uh, recorded 16 significant events. The meaning of significant means that we could uh, saw the runoff from the system. So, uh, uh, then uh, we look at the retention of the green roofs. Uh, for instance, that this graph shows the rainfall and runoff. This is the rainfall graphs, and this is the run this is the runoff. You can see we had. Uh, the green roofs were able to uh, meet, to make a delay of 100, 150 minutes, and uh, it was able to uh, reduce the peak of the rainfall for 40 percent. Also, we look at the retention of green roofs. Uh, that graph shows the seasonal uh, changes. Uh, it means that as far as the weather gets hotter and and, and we have a more inter-event or, or longer spell, we have a more retention. I mean, the retention is very close to the 100%. Uh, 
So the results show the average retention was 74 percent in the in extensive system and 88.6 uh, resulted from the intensive system. Uh, uh, average attenuation time or that delay time was three hours from the extensive system and it was nearly 70 hours uh, in the intensive system. So as I said, we continue our research in the next, uh, in the third experiment. Uh, in this experiment, we were going to more details. We were looking at the effects of four element, elements of green roofs, namely a slope, depth, uh, media, and a species, and their possible interaction in terms of plant growth responses in a dry climate, and what is the combination of what, in, what is the combination of a slope, depth, media, and a species per, produce the optimum performance? And another question was again, we were looking at the outflow water quality from the system because uh, in this system we didn't use any uh, fertilizer and it was account as a low cost and no fertilized systems in a, a small scale green groups. So uh, we designed a, a statistical experiment. Uh, we had three level of uh, plant species two level of a slope, one and 25 degrees. Uh, we look at the available literature and these two level uh, cover all the uh, already studied uh, slopes. We had two level of depths, again 100, 300 millimeters, three media depths, T sorry, three media types. I have some sample of the media that we use. You can have a look if you like later. Uh, Totally, we had uh, 36 configuration of green roof in this part of the study. And the independent variables was, as I said, water quality, quantity, retention, and plant performance. Uh, apart from those 12 green roof beds, we had four non-vegetated systems to compare the uh, water quality of the vegetated and non-vegetated system, and also looking at water requirement of the plants. So these two photos shows the start of the experiment. This one is the start. We started with the small plants, and this is after one year of uh, monitoring. So the, we used three new plants in this part of the research. The first one was cut leaf daisy or rock, rocky daisy or hawksberry daisy. Another one was everlasting and we used another type of pig face, which was round leaf pig face. We used three growing media. One of them was, again, red crush tree. The other one was excoria. And the third one was combination of 50% excoria and 50% uh, organic media. So again, we measured some responses. Uh, like plant average height, relative growth rate, which means how much plants get weight and how much they grow daily. Root and shoot biomass, plant growth, growth radius, survival, leaf succulent, root growth, and water use efficiency. So, one of the things that we looked at this research was how the uh, after finish, uh, after one year monitoring this uh, research, we took all of those. Uh, we had 108 plants and we measured those responses. We specifically look at the root growth. Uh, the result shows that the roots pass the uh, geotextile layer and they moved up to the drainage layer. Uh, in the project that the stormwater retention is the main uh, area of the research, so it means that uh, plants can work very well and absorb water. Uh, but uh, in the long term, they may block the drainage layer and they reduce the functionality of the drainage layer. So at the uh, end of that project, uh, the result showed for getting the maximum value of the all responses, the slope of 25, depth of 300, and media type C maximize all the responses. And 
we recommend that this table, uh, which means, for instance, if you want to get a maximum survival rate, it will happen, uh, could be, I selected the one, not good one, a slope of 1 or 25, or depth of 100, 300, with plant P2, a media of B or C, can maximize the responses. So, uh, the result of water quality and quantity, uh, again, we look at the retention in the, in the vegetated and non-vegetated uh, beds. Uh, the results show in the vegetated beds, we had uh, the range of 52 to 95 percent retention, while in the non-vegetated, we had 35 to 65. This means that availability of uh, vegetation, they could increase the retention performance of the green bone. And between the three media that we use, uh, media, the escorio one and the, the organic one, they showed higher retention and the crash brick one showed the lower retention. And also in terms of water quality results, for instance, in two systems, we get uh, cleaner water on less pollutant in the outflow from vegetated system than non-vegetated system. And this one was the uh, quality of the stone water as the inflow to each system. So same thing happened for nitrate and nitrite in this result. So overall, in this, in this part, vegetated system, as I said, acted as a so, again, sink of pollutant. In this research, we didn't add any uh, we didn't add any fertilizer. They were very low maintenance systems, and the level of uh, nutrients was less than the ANZ project. So, the green roof occupants, uh, I saw quite often uh, ants and spiders during the project. Especially, I had a real problem with ants during this study. <laughs> So in conclusion, uh, it's really important to develop a resilient green roofs model to both micro and micro scale for the city of Adelaide. In ANZ uh, field site, we assess the long uh, term performance of four different green roofs. In MLK means Mawson Lakes project, we assess the long term performance of 16 green roofs. Uh, they also provide a useful demonstration site. We need to do further research in this regard. We need a longitudinal study over a five to 10 years period. That would be ideal for examining the changing performance of the green roof over time. Uh, further investigation using monoculture planting might provide important information to understand individual plant water requirement, water use efficiency, evapotranspiration rate, and cooling potential. Uh, to achieve the sum of the zero-based goals of South Australian government, it would be interesting to develop and investigate more local growing media mixes that utilize various recycled materials. Also, more research uh, also needs to be undertaken for, for developing a numerical model to consider combination of different scenario of introducing green infrastructure into the urban environment. This might include the effect of green infrastructure on air quality, carbon sequestration, to establish low carbon living. Further investigation of the detailed effect of initial moisture and evapotranspiration rates and their interaction with rainfall and runoff in dry climate is recommended. The development of a whole life cost analysis method, which considers all the benefits of green roof system also is recommended. So from our research, we already published 12 uh, publications. Six of them were uh, journal papers in the leading uh, uh, international journals, uh, and we attended six conferences. Uh, now I'm going to the green ball. Uh, generally, green ball system uh, are uh, two types. One of them is green facade, the other one is living ball. 
The green facade uh, are installed for climbing plants that grow vertically uh, without attaching to the surface of the building. Uh, but living walls are a building envelope system where plants are actually planted and irrigated. So they are the example of existing green walls in uh, Australia. The first one is one Bly uh, Street in Sydney. Uh, that's the during construction, and the down left one is the what is look now with the cafe. Uh, the other one is located at Melbourne Central. So they are the ex existing green walls in Adelaide. That's the entrance, and the top two are uh, entrance of Adelaide Zoo. Uh, they are the outdoor green walls. Uh, the down photo shows the indoor green walls, uh, but they didn't perform very well. Uh, they might be because of the light or low maintenance or maybe not selecting good plants. Uh, the other fantastic green, bo green walls that I see recently, it's located on the Oriental Hotel on the corner of McGill Road and Osmond Trace. I think it's about one year old. Telma found it. <laughs> and that's how it looks now. So, we, for continuing our research in green infrastructure, we developed a proposal last year regarding developing resilient green ball for Adelaide. It was founded uh, by SA Water. Uh, then we connect that project to the another project uh, in the uh, uh, another project uh, which is about optimal balance between cooling energy use and green infrastructure irrigation in a dry summer of Adelaide. We have a partner from Flinders University and SA Water. This part of the project also funded by the Department of Environment and Water and Natural Resource in the area of uh, preparing climate change adaptation and showcase. Uh, in Green World Project, we have some objectives. Uh, the first one is we want to look at how Green World can mitigate the urban heat island, or we want to look at the uh, what is the difference between temperature on the green ball and the bare ball? We want to look at the, what sort of indigenous plant species have better performance in Adelaide weather condition. Uh, how much is the cooling and heating effect of green balls? Uh, we want to uh, estimate the water requirement of plants and what is the uh, suitable irrigation regime for green balls. Uh, also, we want to look at to what extent it's possible to use the uh, runoff water, uh, roof runoff for irrigation of green walls. We want to connect the roof uh, to be the wall to be irrigated through the roof. Uh, also, we want to look at the nutrient regime of the outflow water from green roofs. Uh, also, we will look at the biodiversity attraction. Uh, also, we want to look at the, is it possible to connect the outflow water from the green roofs to a fish tank and vice versa, and possibility of aqua aquaponic for the next phase of this project. <coughs> so, the location of our green ball will be at Mawson Lakes campus of University of South Australia. Uh, we have that area, which is an uh, atrium that's inside the building with no ceiling, so it's quiet, could be an outdoor green ball. That's the design, that's the uh, green ball that we expected to put in that area. The actual wall area is about 28 square meter, and we will put the uh, 5 square meter of green roofs on this side. So. Before starting this project, we did some uh, thermal investi investigation on the existing wall, uh, especially during last January, February, we did some measurement. So our result shows that uh, temperature on the wall could increase up to 60 degree, while the temperature on the air, you can see on the, on the Adelaide Kent Town weather station and 
uh, parafield weather station is about 45 degrees. So, which means there are 50 degrees difference between the air and the actual wall. So, for selecting uh, what available green wall is suitable for our project, we look at the felt system. This one is the felt system. This one is the back system. I have this system here. You can have a look later. And because we wanna measure the inflow to the system and outflow, and also we wanna collect the water quality sample, we selected this system. I have this system also here. Uh, also, the problem with this system is this one is produced in US, and there is imported carbon behind of this system. So. We look at the advantage and disadvantage, and finally we decided to go with this system for this project. So again, we have a, a statistical design for doing this project. Uh, we will have nine species. They will randomize on 144 uh, pots of green roofs. Also, we will have two levels of irrigation. The first one, we will provide 100% of water requirement of plants. And another one, we will provide 75%. Uh, that means we want to put plants under a little bit of a stress uh, to find out how much is the uh, suitable uh, enough water for the plants. Also, we will have two different uh, media. The one of them is scoria based. Uh, that's exactly the same material that we use on the green roof system. And the other one is clay base, which uh, originated from somewhere in Adelaide Hills, from Miss Joanne Gibbs. That's the secret for her. <laughs> so, also, we started the plants from seeds. We grow them in the uh, greenhouse, uh, we, will, we will transplant the plants from these parts to the green wall system. So that was my presentation for tonight. Uh, should acknowledge there were a lot of people behind this project, I need to acknowledge them. So thank you everybody for this. Is it north facing or which way is it? Mm, it's hard. <laughs> I, should, I should figure it out. <laughs> uh, that's faced. Can't say. You can get back. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I have no idea. Did you, uh, did you look at or did you extrapolate? Sort of and I'm thinking about light existing uh, I got the impression most of these were like concrete. Yeah. Solid concrete. Yeah. <coughs> what weight can square meter of it? Uh, it's, yeah, it's a, it should be lightweight, so that's why we're using the recycled material like red crush bricks or scoria. So they recommended between 250 less than a ton per square meter for weight of the, yeah. Yeah, it gets heavier, but it gets wet. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because uh, I think, <laughs> The, the the void ratio is uh, is, is around forty percent in in the uh, in the highest uh, rate in the media. Oh, okay. How do you irrigate the So we will use the drip irrigation, and we will have the emitter that will come to each part. Yeah. 
And also in those systems, the problem that we didn't select those systems, they will work like a wicking irrigation. That means the water will leak from the topper uh, pockets to the lower pockets. So, but here we want to have a, a individual or a specific uh, emitter for each of them because we want to measure the inflow and outflow, outflow from each part. So we have yes, this objective in this system. Did you investigate the thermal performance in winter? The, uh, the uh, not yet. We should do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a good yeah. question. Thank you. Yeah. Did you consider ivy for green walls? It'd be a lot easier than having to find a lot of little things all over the wall. Or to find things fixed to the wall. Yeah, I, I said, uh, so is that a green facade or green wall? Because when mentioned, we have two different... Well, it depends how you define it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. The problem is uh, we need to select something that grow quickly because we have just one year. So we thought about using a creeper, but it may take sometimes two or three years to grow up. So yeah, also we were looking at using edible plants in this green wall project. Yeah, but uh, there are problems with the maintenance of university. I mean, we are not allowed to put any holes on the wall, so that's all the problem. <laughs> just, yeah. We should get a contractor to install this system for us. I mean, and the technical people doesn't accept any responsibility for this sort of projects. So, yeah. I don't know if you've seen what they've done in Melbourne. There's a nursery guy there who's way at the times. He uses this big square building vision, which is high sensor, so it takes a lot of weight. For two layers up, he uses ordinary pots at an angle. And therefore, the beauty of that is water just dribbles down and the irrigation doesn't have to extra pipes. But more yeah. importantly, yeah. the winter you can remove them, it gets all the passive solar sun on the wall that hits the house. Yeah. So, total flexibility, very strong with whatever he wants. Yeah. And it's a great way. Yeah, the second thing which you most likely have not investigated is a problem we here in this audience would have to get council permission for you. Yeah, that's right. Just to back on the roof, roof strength, all those buildings that you quoted are existing in Adelaide. Yeah. Did your architectural department or an engineer go along and work out what that roof could take uh, beforehand? I would imagine a very old building could possibly yeah. take it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, this green roof study is uh, like an inter interdisciplinary project. Uh, I think different people from different disciplines like landscape architects, urban planners, civil engineers, uh, everybody look at from their point of view. I and Simon, we had background in civil engineering and mostly water, so we look at from our point of view. So yeah, I think I just uh, heard one failure of green roofs, which had also playground and Latvia, I think it was on the rooftop of, uh, I think it was uh, like a market and after a rain and after a heavy rainfall, I think it fell down and some people died. Yeah. But that's the only failure that I heard from you. But yeah, as you said, I think before any project, the structural engineer should look at the stability of the building for putting this sort of weight on top of it. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. And they should, I think, uh, there is not that much standards regarding green roof implementation. There is just one FLL guideline, which is a, the German guideline. As far as I know, there is no uh, US guideline, but all of this research result can help to I think prepare some guidelines for Australia, probably. Yeah. Okay, one last question. Yeah. You did studies in all the runoff the water entering the Yep, yep, yep. Um, yes, because it's being true, it's high much to do all those other levels. That's right, like yep. Is it going to be acceptable? Is that, is that to be contaminated runoff? Would that be allowed to go into this council storm water? So I showed that graphs, uh, 
Yeah, there are problems with nitrate. There was that in, in the ANZ house, yeah, we had problem with nitrate. So it was also, yeah. Uh, so, no, the main, we were trying to reuse that on the building. We didn't want to just discharge it to the, uh, to the air uh, drainage system. So we were trying to reuse it rather than to discharge it to the... Reuse that size? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that yeah, that's great. Yeah. You couldn't reuse that. You can't collect drinking water, so that water has to go somewhere. Yeah, but some people, uh, maybe secondary treatment, that would be solution for that one. Yeah, a low energy secondary treatment. That's my last question. Mr. thank you very much. That's all right. Um, the ANZ building, yes. is that green roof still on it? No. <laughs> they have taken it down, I think, last year, unfortunately. Last year. They have spent more than 50,000, 60,000 then. To get it removed? Yeah, after changing government, yeah. <laughs> the green roof was so good. Unfortunately, yeah. All right, if you put your hands together, thank the staff. Green wine yeah, for thank you. you. <laughs> it's very good wine. It's yeah, actually it's very good wine. We yeah, actually buy a really nice wine as a clean yeah. skin. So, and a couple of magazines get yeah, it really. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. It's good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, a couple of other things. We have John, thank you for videoing the meeting. You've done a fantastic job. And do you want to talk about the temperature sensors? Data the data loggers. Bring them out and I'll show you. So if you're a member of the ATA, we bought these two data loggers, um, which are standard data loggers that last about three months. Um, you just plug them into USB when you want to grab the data, and you can um, program and set them up for 10 minute intervals, half an hour, one hour, whatever. Um, put one sort of in your bedroom or in your kitchen or wherever you want to do, and the other one just outside, but not in the rain, they're not waterproof. Um, but they'll give you a good idea if you want to see, monitor the thermal performance of your building. So um, we bought those for members to borrow, and you can have them for a month. So you program them up, grab the data, and uh, there's some nice, nice information comes out of You can check your frigid freezer with them too. You can check your frigid freezer. But I uh, don't think these ones are actually moisture. They're not that high in humidity. So um, anyway, they're here for members to borrow. <coughs> no advantage of being a member of the ATA. Um, are there any other questions that people would like to ask about problems they've got or houses or anything happening? Uh, I had a quote for a solar panel on my roof recently, and REC vents leak to them rather strongly. So I'm wondering. I thought to myself, well, if the federal government's going to get rid of rats, how will that affect the cost of solar panels on my roof? Put the hand that over to Stuart. Are you up on that one, Tyler? It's. I'm not totally up on that, but it, I think the, the current rebate system is based on is, uh, the renewable energy um, renewable certificates, is one thing I right? are based on uh, 15 years of the output from your system times whatever the renewable energy to be as worth, which currently is about $30. Um, so if you have a one kilowatt system, I think it generates about one and a half megawatt hours per year, or a bit less, and then multiply it by 15 by about 30, will give you how much the current rebate is, which is a few thousand, I think it is, or one or two thousand. So if the, if the renewable energy target is totally abolished, then that will system that discount will disappear. So I should get it real quick. Yeah, you should, you should always get it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the person mentioned this solar energy, just made me think. Uh, last week I uh, got my power bill and worked out that 30% um, less um, solar energy. So I asked an expert and it seems that um, it's been down 18, solar energy has been down 18 to 20% with the same time for the last five years. If anyone's got a question when they see their account. So you're saying the actual, the actual energy generated yeah, due yeah, to the sun? Yeah, you know, okay. the clouds or the rain or invisible water or whatever. Right. Okay. 
wasn't aware of that one. If you looked at PV output, that would probably give you some trending figures. You could probably see that. Um, PVoutput.org is a really good website. There's thousands of people around the world, and you can actually monitor people's systems performance. So you might be able to see a graph that trends down on that to confirm that. I think, Steve, that was a mob stuff just in Adelaide. I think the month of July was the solar insulation in July was above average. I don't know what the figure was, but it was below average. Yeah, 20%. Yeah. And also in June. Right, okay. Right. Interesting. Any other questions? Everybody's ready for tea and biscuits? I'll, I'll give a report about the... Yeah, last Monday we had an opening at uh, Brighton. Oh, another benefit of being an ATA member. <laughs> <laughs> last Monday we had a, an opening at uh, Finn and Chantel Peacock's Straw Bale House at Brighton. And about 24 people turned up and it was a really good event. I'd uh, certainly recommend you have a look at that on Sustainable House Day and especially it's on open on the 7th and 14th of September. If you're available you could even be a volunteer there. It was a good night, it was very easy to organise and hopefully we'll have a few more ad hoc openings of houses like that. It's cool. Okay. Okay. Pleasure to meet. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Just a reminder that the current Sanctuary uh, edition is out, this is edition number 128, so it's, uh, if you're members you may already subscribe to this, if you're not members um, we have it going for $10 when it's normally about 12 so please come have a look at that, there are some Adelaide homes that feature in here. And, um, as a freebie, because we don't have any free magazines to give anybody, one of our members generously has donated some lemons. <laughs> so, it's not the dog and lemon, but we're giving away lemons. Um, please help yourself to some lemons if you'd like to take some on the way out. Thank you. All right, thanks for coming. Have a cup of tea. Presentations get put up on the website. Is it? Good luck.